first, I'm going to ask the panelists, first of all, I guess, introduce myself. I'm Craig Cerrone. Um, I'm the Director of Technology at Digital Domain 3.0. Um, I was saying yesterday that we're going to start naming the company with our destinies and products. So we're going to be DD 2015 next year. Let's keep going um, <clears throat> So I'm going to ask my fellow panelists here to introduce themselves, and then we'll jump into it and for the next hour. So. Apparently I'm next. Um, I'm Phil Peterson. I, I consult a visual effects and animation companies on technology, strategy, and architecture, which is a business-friendly way of saying I'm a conscientious objector of full-time employment. Um. Uh, Troy Brooks. I'm currently the product manager for Studio Cloud, which is a series of uh, data centers in Canada where uh, uh, visual effects, media, and entertainment companies pool resources and uh, share a render workstation and licensing and storage. It's very hard to hear you in the back. I apologize for lack of microphone. Only I have one. Sorry. I can't oh, read this one either. So I get, I get the picture, so I've got to speak up, right? Is it OK now? <laughs> um, my name is Dave Hilderjois. I've uh, worked in South Spanish 10 years working on the Mandalorian integration. And probably I've worked with some of you in the past. Um, and after that, I went to work for Autodesk and tried to improve mental reintegration over there for a couple of years. And um, and then after that, I went to Ireland to work on a couple of, you know, R&D internal projects um, in the realm of lighting and rendering. And um, so I'm back in Montreal doing a feature film, um, you know, for kids. So that's pretty much what I do. Hi, everybody. I'm Darren Grant, and I talk loud, so that works out well. Um, I'm a consultant to the industry, which is a nice way of saying I'm unemployed. So if you like what I say, uh, it's hire me out <laughs> after this thing. Um, previously, I was, most recently, I was the uh, CTO at Method Studios. And a part of that, I worked at uh, DreamWorks Animation as head of production technology, and then a uh, decade at the main before that. Okay. Um, so I do. I have a couple of pre-prepared topics. Um, just to start off with, but I'm going to pick up with a couple of from the audience. So, um, in a sort of random order, uh, let's talk about um, dashboards and monitoring. And sort of right now, uh, if you're a render farm, your render manager may or may not even provide that. How much sleep did you get last night? Uh, not very much. <laughs> <laughs> I can start a little bit with what I've been involved with. Um, and actually, hopefully, I'm actually counting on the audience as a bunch of things that they want to see or that they've done that's really, really amazing to share with everybody else. Um, I didn't go through my background, but I've um, been you know, <coughs> in business for 20 years, from software engineer to running research and development for ILM to leading technology for Lucasfilm, CTO for Digital Domain 1.0, um, somewhere in there, maybe 1.6, yeah. uh, <laughs> as well as Disney and smaller companies. Um, a lot of the time when I come in as a consultant, uh, people in the last recent years you look at, people want to answer questions about their performance, how well their infrastructure is working, their facility, and in this particular context, render farm. Uh, what I found is a lot of studios who did have resources were tracking an enormous amount of information, but they weren't really using it to visualize much except in very basic ways. So a lot of the interest I uh, sort of developing in analytics was to provide as much real-time feedback off render farms using as much of modern sort of hardware and modern technology as possible. But really, I think the interesting thing I'd like to hear what people feel about this is when you compare render farm monitoring, and this is personal opinion certainly, but it's a birds with feathers, so I'm allowed to do that. Did everybody hear me? Like, am I talking about them? Okay, because I had a pretty late night. Um, the, if you look at traditional, a lot of traditional systems monitoring, you know, email servers, whatever it is. The idea is you really don't want to be beating the crap on them. You know, the point is you want to know when they're running hot. And with, with render farms, what you really want to do is actually beat the crap on them. You want to squeeze every single ounce out of it. And when you have a lot of a lot of machines, the patterns you need to look at, like how your aggregate performance works, becomes kind of like a noise function. So if you just use sort of simple thresholding techniques in the traditional systems wiring, you don't get a picture of what's causing you to have less performance overall than what. So, you know, a lot of people are been doing other visualization techniques in the industry, not in this industry, but other ones, to be able to display larger amounts of information in real time or historically or near real time. Because frankly, educated humans are people with 
run render bars or experience regulars or anyone else, um, have really great perceptual cues. Yeah, they, they actually can recognize patterns far better than most people might not. So they're sort of my blur, but I'd really like to hear, I think others would as well, how many people again in studios or how many people are running render farms here who are really concerned about analytics? Have they built systems for it that they're now using? Or is it something that you feel that you actually need and go for it? And now this isn't a pitch for my stuff. Well, I'll do a pitch for your stuff, because I was his first customer, the only customer I've been so far. So far. Uh, it's really cool because it is that, I mean, at least I have been, I'm sure most of you have been in the situation of maybe you can get some, some maybe you're collecting some statistics on a per node basis, but as that render queue starts to get larger and larger and larger, like scrolling and scrolling and scrolling through a bunch of different lines to understand the aggregate CPU load on your on your car is something that you kind of like, there's a point where you can't just squint and kind of get the picture of it all. And so he's done some really nice uh, visualization in order to pull that together into a, a, something that makes sense, something that makes sense useful, because it fills with a CTO and I'm an Omni company. Um, so he understands what he would be looking for as a CTO, and so I, I think it's... I think the really important. interesting thing about that is that it's increasingly less about, well, about how loaded your CPUs are, it's more about bottleneck and not storage. I mean, increasingly, there's been like, there's like four uh, render farm birds of a feather, and, and all the ones I've been, it's been, sorry, it's like, <laughs> uh, it's been about storage. It's really been about I.O. And, and CPUs being starved for I.O. And that's really where the heat maps are, is, is trying to get more out of the out of the storage. But I would be interested to hear what people's experience is. I'm sure there's somebody out there who's running farm. Yeah, I would like to point out, I'm dealing with perhaps as more than the um, So just to take, I, I come from a different background because I'm starting a brand new studio. Scratch. So, next gen is basically what I have to look for. It's like fully the latest integration. So, I don't have any legacy. But one of the biggest problems that I'll be facing is the unknown, which is where basically those bottlenecks, what type of bottlenecks. And right now, it's what are the solutions out there. And I, I strongly believe it should be part of the, you know, uh, an actual product because it's the interaction of the software, the OS, and then the network. And right now, there's really no good way. Just a, a good segue to this is the way we write code, especially Python code. I come from a QA background, so all the uh, everything we write is basically all of it, it's, it's written to be software, but it basically hits a lot of the, the servers, so a lot of stats, so on and so forth. And actually, those things as it aggregates and executes basically could actually kill the server. And this is the kind of information that a system like this will tell you: say, you're just killing this particular aspect of the server. So that's sort of my take is what is what are the things I don't know that I should know. I mean I know that when we when we've seen really large farms hooked up to really large ice lawn, raised ice lawn nodes, um, we segregated the traffic to, you know, uh, desktop trends on nodes on the other. IO, if I if I remember correctly, um, was, was not our a huge concern except with specific jobs that were really swarmy, like you know, some simulations like that. But uh, it did seem that there was a balance where if you had enough ice lawn nodes, in this specific case, I'm not endorsing ice lawn, I just love it. Uh, that, that was one area where we did have massive amounts of, you know, frames on, on you know, greater than 10,000 cores running. And I won't say it was a non-issue, but it was more space than throughput. And it didn't work. I mean, but that was throwing a lot of, a lot of hits in and a lot of issues. Yeah. I think the interesting thing about about what Phil's doing, and, and anybody can do this, so it's not a pitch for drawing, is that it's, a, is that it's a, an agnostic area to keep this information. Because, like, whether it's one form of one form of storage or another, you'll get different statistics and different data into one database. If you're pulling it, if you're storing it all in the render queue, in the render queue itself, it's just that information. But if you have a way to aggregate all that information together, because it is not just about what, like, what your efficiency is and pushing out frames and how, how how those come back and how many frames you process, it's also about your efficiency on the actual processes. So pulling all that information together and that creates this really that I mean we're talking about future of regular queues go. And none of them are really none of the commercial ones are behind yeah, that none of none of the commercial ones are really doing it yet. Um, I, I think that's the right direction to go to. And you see this across you know, 
visual effects is this really insular, this really insular world, but like you see this across all these other industries, right? Half our highly of our industry is making a shit ton of money doing business analytics, like data data visualization with Tableau instead of doing cool computer graphics stuff. Okay, kind of coming back to the future thing, not dwelling on analytics because no one seems to be jumping in too much, but um, the you know, because we were talking like what do people want to see in render forms, like, what does the next generation look like? You know, the other birds were feather, you know, although everyone seems to want to talk about file servers an awful lot. Let's just stop that for a second. But the you know, the, the cloud topic comes up as well. And when you start looking, the first thing that people studios usually look at cloud computing for, and I'm sure we can touch on that that topic somewhere in, somewhere, somewhere in here, is because they want to burst capacity. And if you look at it from a business point of view, try to you know, uh, manage a render farm, like how do you want to do that in the future? How do you know when you really need to burst? And you know, one way to know is because the soup is yell yelling at you, saying, oh, we need more procs, my god. Um, but are you really using the procs that you have? Because that's a different thing from, um, you know, are you allocating all your processors? Do are you actually using all your processors effectively? And as you go into models where you're talking about spot pricing, commodity bursting, um, you know, it seems to me that in that generation, whatever those software tools are from a management standpoint, there, there really are going to need to incorporate some form of cost modeling and measurement for you know, when do I really need to increase this capacity and when do I decrease this capacity? Because we're not exactly a, you know, money bags full industry. No, I think so. Well, I can say you're touching on something that's really interesting because we're, we're talking about kind of is my farm fully loaded and that's one measure of efficiency, but also am I getting frames out the door and the right ones is, is a different thing. And that's a harder question. It's not yeah. numerical in some ways. You know, that's kind of so two ideas along that. In terms of uh, am I getting am I getting the right value for my money out of my farm? Uh, the first thing to do is it, besides just creating some cost modeling, they start to put some ownership responsibility on people using that service, right? If, you're, if you have an open credit card and, and you don't have to write around the farm. We do that right now because we all have a fixed capital asset. We have, oh, I've got a hundred cores, or I've got ten cores, or I've got a thousand cores, and so you're motivated to, to utilize us as much as possible to support and pay for it, right? Whether it's a good or a bad frame. I mean, I think about if anybody was just in that next gen animation tools panel, they're doing some lot of a lot of smart things. They're trying to, they have a machine there. They're using that in order to generate maybe some caches that are totally useless, but they might be useful. And if they're useful, it's a, it's a cache in, it's a huge savings, and it's a huge savings. If you're paying per cycle, you don't want to do that at all. You want to make sure that it's absolutely useful. And so one of the things to do, which is probably a little bit uh, controversial, but you guys are all a bunch of render park people around the different types of collectors probably, is uh, having to put some onus on the actual artist to say, hey, you're about to spend $10,000. Are you sure? Yes, no. Like, I hate the experiment for giving feedback to production in the terms of, of rental props. I think you four hours based on dollars just to, just to show producers Few long renders, and yet he, when I said, "Well, this was a six thousand dollar render," he just ran over the weekend. Their eyes lit up, and they, 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 they blew their mind. And of course, that was a certain great uh, construct. That, you know, <laughs> but um, you know, yeah, I think costing. And I believe there are some. I don't know if it's heard, but there are some shots that can cost back those render costs, and that right there will trigger production to react. Until they have a speed of dollars, they won't speak. It's like doing first. Sorry, the Rams. What I was talking to global difference in my point of view about some gamification of, of giving back props. There's also the gamification of being more the most optimal and most efficient in terms of your prop usage. Yeah, I would. I actually that I would disagree with you with the script here. That's never happened before. The first point of the night. Um, over like because we start and we have a very limited budget. I mean, we don't have like unlimited, unlimited cores. In fact, so what we do is, is we can ask people to be responsible, but there are humans, right? So, um, and then faulty, man. <laughs> they don't follow the rule, man, uh, three in the morning. So uh, over there, what we decide to do is, is actually say you got three shots or four shots, right? You know, and then if you basically run out of those, you got to explain why you ran out of those. And just basically, their responsibility is to enter within the particular budget of Attempts, it, you know, sort of, you know, creative iterations, and then after that, you gotta justify because this is your four shot or try. Basically, is what is in budget. If you run out of it, it's basically we're running over budget. 
because that is the way we we going to do it over. So we're whether not, whether so it works or not, let me we're, we're much of that. Let me drag this back to one of the now we're getting to human engineering. Look for the future. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> because if we could build better, you know, clients, that would be a really big advance. But, yeah. <laughs> um, but you mentioned the cloud, so let's talk about it for a while. Um, you know, how practical is that really? And, and what does that mean? I mean, are we talking about a, a manager in the cloud and our own clients? Are we talking about the whole thing in the cloud? How do we, how do we get that to happen? And what would people expect that to mean for them? Can I kick it off with a question about sure. this? Because this is, you know, in, in some not small amounts of business areas, the you know, software as a service is a thing. You know, not talking about using the cloud for your computing, that's all part of it. But you know, if you were, say, a small shop and you didn't really want to light up a separate you know, piece of hardware to run your render farm management, would you, would you want to subscribe to a render farm management system that was software as a service? I mean, that's different than whether, wherever the processors are coming from. Would people, would you, are you cringing if I said that? Or are you going like, well, no, you know, I've only got 15 so that's my own 15 machines, but somebody else is going to Yeah, or maybe some, you have another 20 machines in AWS or Google or something. But, you know, for the, for you know, a certain segment of people who have, a lot of people who are starting with small vendor farms, and they may not have a big IT staff or something, you don't necessarily want to, you know, yet have another machine. You've got to light up to control these other machines when you don't have all that. You know, just, I, and there, and there are also licensed per processors, so if you're bursting up processors, like, have to have two conversations, one with the AWS guy and one with the, one with the vendor. Yeah. Well, and I think every aspect of the business is trying to go to to an OpEx model where everything is, is built to the show and where it's uh, granular enough. So, you know, your software licenses, ideally you go to a monthly billable thing where you can wrap up and wrap down, wrap up and wrap down on storage. That's not quite there yet, but bursting uh, capacity into the cloud. I think the, the big concern about that is probably performance. Yeah. You know, I mean, if you look at things like AWS or, you know, things hosted, let us say, services hosted in AWS, then it's it's the, 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 the iterative performance there that's, that's the only concern. So does anybody want to actually answer Phil's question about would that be a valuable model or is it going to be too large to consider that? I'd, I'd be interested in, from an education point of view, of trying that, assuming that the management of it in terms of billing and such is is easy. And of course, the cost as well. I tried uh, some cloud services a couple of years ago, just some test renders, and the biggest frustration wasn't the actual getting the frames back, was when they billed me, I couldn't get a receipt. So, you know, if, if, they have, if the business end is there too, that, uh, that I can get the documentation needed, that's important as well as the, as the performance. At least you use your idle processors to mine for Bitcoin. <laughs> but yeah, that's fine. And actually, what I was thinking, you know, just maybe clarify that, you know, there's the whole all encompassing, you know, uh, services where you're submitting and managing your jobs and rendering it and charging your licenses, like the same render model would have been one of those. But you know, just looking at the idea of software as a service in this particular industry segment, you know, I can see a lot of studios or a lot of people being reluctant to want to go down that path simply because I don't have my hands on it. That was a more question. Uh, sorry, this is not one, one question. I'm not well, I'm just trying to go no comment. No, it's just you know, I came up with one of those other services. This is the whole configuration nightmare of the unique you know, the image out there, you need to set up the machine. And, Especially, I mean, for larger studios, especially about uh, DreamWorks, so, and uh, larger studios, there is the idea more about your know, private cloud to manage that. But I think when you get to the small, unique places, it gets a little bit tricky. Right well, I don't mean, know. Yeah. Same was trying to handle by pre spinning up servers in a lot of situations now. Like, I, I think what's one thing that's interesting about the public cloud right now is, is the, uh, the, the level of tool development and the level of innovation that's going on there. Is, the eclipse is what we've seen internal to the Bindle Flex industry for quite some time. So like from one year to the next, the number of the stack that's available and the, the issues that they're addressing in terms of like you talked about the spin up of, of new servers, it's pretty common. Like actually that's I, I, I don't think that's as big of an issue this year as what last year at all. 
Has anybody here ever attended the, you know, one of the AWS summits or something like that? <laughs> yeah, okay, a couple people. Um, you know, the last one I went to in San Francisco, it was an interesting thing that in the you know, exhibition or at the trade show, I would guess that probably 75% of the products being out there or how to manage your resources in the cloud. Now, so right. nothing to do with computing in the cloud. <clears throat> so how do I determine whether I spend way really too much money that I didn't really want to, and how do I measure that and control it and deploy it? Now that's, you know, either, either there's a lot of people trying to make a company that, for a product that doesn't exist, or this is a real issue, you know? By the way, we've got to figure out a new way for doing exhibitor lists, because if you go to the AWS, the C section, Exhibitor this thing because they're all starting with cloud. All right, well, let's talk about a little bit about um, user interface on a future written one. Um, it's a topic. Um, web based, browser based, uh, don't care, anybody? Local lines are fine. <clears throat> and then tie that into maybe the Android part of this, you know, like. Plug in from my transatlantic flight and see how my river comes in. Well, I mean, one of the, you know, from a technical advantage that I'm you know, thinking of putting a product development hat on is, you know, going with, with web based standards or web based interfaces now, that it does help you in your engineering costs. I mean, maybe not the initial deployment, but, um, you know, you, you don't have to make sure that your toolkit and your UI and your native applications are working on three different operating systems and two different flavors or three different flavors of each one and, you know, library compatibilities, which is the basic discussion I think is happening next door with the, uh, the VFX plat reference platform discussion. Um, and, you know, it does open up the idea for certain things around, uh, you know, maybe somebody who really needs some larger of key aspects with their shop end, it's, it's a little bit easier to do global deployment. Um, yeah. You, you know, in that sense. So, well, you leverage new toolkits and new technologies that come out of the browser. Yeah, yeah, and you know, all the kids today are learning web stuff, so it's easier to hire programmers uh, to kind of build those UIs. <laughs> um, so, you know, I think in that sense it does. The, the issues that I've heard expressed, and you know, again, maybe people jump in, um, is that they're concerned about the security of it. Um, you know, there's, there's certainly studios now, the visual effects studios, in the, you know, let's split a movie into 15 different shops where sometimes people are getting extremely defined in terms of security. Uh, I, you know, have one that's a client who the artists who are looking at the render queue who are working on one show, there's, there's two other shows, where they're not actually even allowed to know the name of the jobs. They can't actually go in and see the text for the name of the jobs that's being rendered, and that's, that's in their client contract. And so when you start getting into web standards, you know, uh, authentication and security does become a little bit more difficult than data. But, you know, I don't know if that's a trend or whether they just have the client that I don't want to eat. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe you split that a little bit. If there's monitoring remotely, which is one thing, and then, then there's affecting what's happening remotely, which is a different thing. Yeah, well, I think I guess the affecting is the, you know, for the rest of the APIs have become, you know, most development industry is pretty much the common standard now. Um, so that does make it pretty straightforward, I think, for for being able to you know, offer job control and API control to a variety of mechanisms. It doesn't have to be a click in the browser. It can, it can go other ways. And that does make it more consistent for people who you know, do want to develop their own tools and, you know, around how they're controlling and not with a, a product given and ship out of the box and everything. So, uh, uh, I think that's just indicative of a switch to try to make APIs that are easier to access rather than having to learn multiple fairly complicated APIs. So uh, I, I think customization also makes user interface more because every every site would, would need to track, you know, are you you know, have some sort of data matrix or information they you might want or some custom submission jobs or stuff like that. So customization, if there is such a thing as a next gen UI customization should part of it. You know, where you, you, you don't need to hack an actual web server or some kind of service right. to be able to do your UI, so it has to be sort of like a plug in there. Because Wranglers will need a different view than TDs, who will need a different view than artists, will need a very different view than producers. That's really the thing that comes back to the question of software as a service or not. Because the more customization you offer somebody, the less ability, the less ability you have to have in this these software as a service platform that everybody is using. Yeah. So, I, I, I don't 
don't know. I mean, what Troy was saying in terms of like customization is fun, but like at some point, like you really need a different view for a producer at Studio X versus a producer at Studio Y. So for people here who are using, let's say, not internal products, like not internally developed systems, because theoretically and hopefully, if you've got the trouble of developing a system internally, you build what you want, and it looks like the way you want it. I hope so. If not, I'm sorry. Um, but for people who are using commercial products, you know, if you're looking at what you want out of a render farm management in the future, you know, do you like what you have today? Is it completely wrong? Are you being given products that you're presented with a whole ton of information that might be you just don't care about, or you're not getting the information? I mean, uh, if you feel that the market is on target with with, with what a UI should be. <laughs> I think some have been better than others for us. We've used some products that I thought were better for artists and managers, and then other ones that I don't think do a good job targeting the artist who just quickly wants to see how the preview frames done. Can I look at the you know, look at the frames really easily? And if there are errors, a lot of it's very verbose and for artists and that it's too much to go through. And then they just say, hey, I have an error. They can't really tell us why. So then somebody else has to then go back. Find a job that was actually an error, and then go through it, start digging through, got to figure it out. So I think there's some, there's some things left to be desired for UI reporting. Yeah, the reporting is like that's the number of dollars, especially because uh, we do a lot of machine learning and some of the and uh, especially with errors. Yes, then CPU artists are more I mean, more technical savvy than the CPU artists. So I mean, even if they say see an error, they kind of know what that is, and they can be given better. But especially for the GPU artists, like they have no idea what's going on. Error, that's it. I'm not doing the shots. You know, go for it. So UI being that we've been mean, uh, yeah, using the cube for a while, but like, even in terms of UI, like I mean, the UI is great for the branders and the people who know what it's showing you, but for the artists, that need a lot of information that they're really interested in. Actually, I think that's a good point about 2D because I think we're seeing a lot more of people <coughs> trying to expand uh, 2D. Uh, rank uh, I think we get a show of hands of people who are working in 2D. So if you, but, uh, and, and actually doing substantial rendering or, uh, or uh, one and a half. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and the same thing for uh, uh, reporting as well. So again, like there's not much reporting in there, but there is some reporting, but again, not. So we have uh, you know, our own reporting system where we see graphs for how much range we do in one night. We are running all the time, only talks are running every night, and stuff like that. So that kind of gives us a good position in terms of you know, project how much time do we need to finish a show we do like deliver every show every week, right? Yeah. And again, the same for 2D and 3D, but then it also helps with the fitting for the show because you know, we know how it might take to actually operate something. Forget there's nothing. 
So, yeah, uh, no matter how you wrap them up, it's it's, it's all better. Yeah. Yeah, I'd actually, yeah. Say, I'd well, actually start to ask you then, because you said you come from a QA background. There are a lot of nice QA techniques that you can apply through continuous integration or a lot of the knowledge base, automated knowledge base things that you do. I think you can apply some of those techniques and technology to categorize, to look exactly what you're doing, categorizing the errors, get the right person to figure out what's going on. Well, in one place, you could, um, there are essentially databases of errors. You could say, well, have you seen this 800 times before? I think it's likely that this is the problem. And I don't know if that exists in any point of ours, but yeah, so like me. <laughs> 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 yeah, so well, I think it's like a random issue, but is having different UIs for different departments resonates. I mean we we have our own internal tool that we still have this problem, right? Some people want to see the full, you know, you know, job graphs, some people just want to see like, you know, a binary error done, right? Like and uh, and so that, that problem that problem still exists even if you're writing your own tool. Well and with commercial products and multiply that by like, hundreds of yeah, yeah, right. customers well have their own idea about how it should be. <laughs> I haven't seen there's a lot of there's a lot of like oh sorry, go ahead. I was just gonna say I've never seen a few for producers in bigger problems. What do you think would be hope that trend continues? Well what would be it? <laughs> <laughs> I mean you know you talk about accountability and how much money you're wasting in a project or how much you know, Crocs, your team is using so dollars so That's the plug-in plan for regular watches. Watches. <laughs> <laughs> I've generated this report for you. <laughs> <laughs> I know, John. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, having a one sheet is actually tell. So, so, so the other thing is, there is no additional place for the city to produce it because they've got a whole bunch of people spreadsheets, databases to do with production management. So a lot of that fine-grained stuff that you have read in space, like the data review or something like that, needs to be positive in amongst all of those things. Right. Well that's that thing about having it having it be a copy so you can you can aggregate all aggregate or push down all these things. Yes guys here I one one thing I want to cover is scheduling. Is uh I, is you guys do some interesting stuff about scheduling and analogic or at least did for a while until people got pissed. <laughs> and then that's it. Yeah. We have a philosophy done. Yeah. And what is it? Should you want to talk about it? Or did I totally just copy this? <laughs> <laughs> if you know, then Daryl will tell you the password he thinks it is. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the, the other thing I'll say is that to me, that farm stuff like that, control over the schedule, like the schedule, yeah, and we're down to paraphrase. And uh, we're about to take where we are, I'm taking the money out. Very old farm, it's 80 years old. But the justification for that is I'm control over the schedule. And understanding the schedule, the why it's going to not just for the aggregate results. It does, it does strike me that. Uh, that we talk, we're talking about sort of render bar management solutions in the future, that there are diverse enough workloads now out there. That, and it's not, you know, even this, we're talking about render management, but, you know, it's not, it's about arbitrary processing. It's still the bulk of it, it's probably rendering in most places, but not all of it is simulation. I mean, yeah, the, the, bulk the bulk of the time is probably rendering, but the bulk of the jobs probably is yeah. not. This yeah, well, how many transcoding yeah. jobs do you have? Well, and I think increasingly the render farm management system, whether it's commercial or in-house or open source or whatever, has become the front end for most people's view of the entire IT infrastructure. So if there's a problem, it's the farm is broken. It doesn't matter if it's a networking issue or an IO storage issue or actual problems on materials, which is pretty rare. That's Our experience is whatever's going against the network. Oh yeah, what's that too? Yeah, exactly. Uh, but it looks here. But the network is over. Sorry, yeah, sure. yeah, you have me go to that level. Was that the because of these diverse workloads and, and a lot of the, the traditional, especially commercial products, or even the single thing does, they, they had a pretty singular concept of scheduling on those. And I think you know, I think what you were saying is that you, in the future it, it has to be pretty straightforward to you know, maybe not have to go in and engineer the leading algorithm and write the core code that might be what some people want to do, but to do some tuning and scheduling algorithms and it may be a not quite so true but right. there, there are situations where that arises. Right? And, that, and that's what you see actually, so you start it out to general cloud computing services, that's the issue with AWS, right? It's like, okay, out of the box you can do this, you can put, put up your stack very quickly, but that tuning, that the ability to tune is where you are spending 10x to 10x of what you actually should be spending. But there's, there's different level of tuning, for example, you schedule for next day, maybe it's more stuff that you can actually can actually wait for a couple of days, then those ones can actually use different scheduling algorithms for that. So, you know, for, you know, I'm always thinking, I'm, I'm the one who carries the hat for the small company here, but 
I'm always thinking, it's like, okay, what is going to be the best way for me to optimize my perform and the way I break up the job. So, you know, generate the landing, generate ribs and render, and then, or do it all at once. And then how this, this sort of setup will impact the render time and also the scheduling. If you change any of that, you know, am I actually going to get worse in terms of delivery and then people are dating to say, so yeah, I think we have the answer to that. Yeah. I got lots of questions. Yeah. And that is that optimization. What is the what is the optimizing function? Yeah. What are you actually optimizing for? That's, that's, a, that's yeah. a really good question. And that's very hard questions. Right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you've got yeah. so many people who want to optimize. I'll look at at least what I see right now. Keep you as aware of viewpoint, whatever it is. That um, but the optimizing function people are looking for is utilization, right? But really, what you know most businesses want to optimize for is through. Right, and, and throughput is correct to their business. Throughput might, in some cases, mean that time to delivery is not the optimizing function, but the overall how much throughput in some aggregate period of time is. But in some cases, it's a mixture of that is, you know, certain sets of things are time sensitive throughput, and you're optimizing in different functions for that. I think that's where you know we'll, we'll, there's some really interesting ideas around how one starts to look at scheduling. And if you expand that to the cloud concept or you know, overall burst capacity virtualization. Not because of cloud computing itself is any different, but one of the things that people become concerned about quickly, especially in classic VFX pipelines with lots of little pieces and pipeline scripts and stuff going on, is their IO demands. My data could be where I need it to be with the latency characteristics. So if you take the idea of the future of a dependency graph or you know something similar to a dependency graph and a tunable scheduling algorithm, and maybe you're even got a facility that's got render farms in five different locations. You know, how are you now subtasking out so you're scheduling optimal or locality reference cache coherency latency characteristics in addition to how much processing there? To my knowledge, there isn't a queuing system, at least a commercially available one today in this market, that touches on that. That is truly a future problem. You just ran over three of the topics I wanted to bring up. One of them, one of them no, it's fine. One of them was um, the sort of queue of queues that, you know, people, including us, have multiple. Um, Two centers, for lack of a better term, and uh, multiple farms and multiple sets of data. And um, ideally, I mean, like to be able to submit to one thing and have the stuff go somewhere and do something and then come back and then know where it be magical. But right, since we're talking about the future, right now we all do have localized winter farms everywhere. Do you really see that sort of right model for five years from now, or because you don't get rebates on tree nodes, <coughs> right? Unlike you mentioned, some places. So they put them all there. Yeah, where's that place? The entire studio. Possibility. I mean, that, that comes down to how do you deal with the scheduling aspect of it, right? You schedule, right? And then compute scheduling or render scheduling too. There is, you know, the concept that you've got a pretty stable pipeline, and you know, it's just sort of flowing through. You're doing all the processing steps. You're getting, you know, here's the image that comes up the back end. But the truth of the matter is that there's a lot of human intervention in those steps. So. You know, if you had that sort of remote compute scenario, maybe you're using just the back end of the pipeline as an example where you know, you're chasing a cog off a lot of layers off, off a series of renders and you're doing a remote facility, but your compositor's here, you know, which is the more cost effective function to transfer all the data over to the so that the render can compute frames and then bring back the compositor to be able to deal with it directly, or is the optimal function to just ship the pixels back up in the first step? And that's what I was talking about with sort of IO concepts within dependency routes is choosing how to, you know, align the your data referencing in order to have the most efficient overall transfer. Well, I guess that's what I'm getting to is, is I, I think in the future we can have a few weeks, right? That's a lot, but in the future you start to aggregate all your cloud all your compute nodes. And that's once you do that, the very next thing you have to do is aggregate all your data. Yes. The best the most important thing here is like the distance from the compute nodes to the data rather than any of that stuff to the artist. And now with PC over IP yeah. solutions, you can start to do exactly what you're saying. Just by looking at the pixels. That also gets well over the security issue. They're not just one place. So, you, but should it be the data is, is the first step towards going fully cloud? So you put the data over there, make sure it's fast, work, make sure it works security wise. And then after that, you add this layer where you start to manage process its data. Because, you know, if, if you want to compute on the cloud and the data is not there, then it's sort of like, you know, go together because otherwise, then you like if you have your compute and your users locally, then you're going and you're touching the data and then you're sending yeah. it to the cloud or you're sending it to your compute nodes and you're coming back. Like that's a 
It's also yeah. kind of in a time sensitive industry. You know, I mean, Craig made that comment, you know, it's always the network, you know, there rarely is, but sometimes it actually is. And, you know, in the same decentralized, even so, <laughs> You know, if you are in a time sensitive industry, I think you know, there is a risk analysis to be taken to, you know, all my data is nowhere near where my people are. That's, yes, yes. You know, that's something that has to happen, right? That's, you have to deal with it. And you can, you can deal with it with money or not. Um, I mean, I, I had a personal you know, experience with this. Um, you know, really, the studios were just starting to go global uh, a few years back. And um, dealing with the you know, US and Asia or and we had a very, you know, at the time, you know, OC3, which is like, you know, um, it's amazing, which is kind of like an Xfinity Internet in California. But the, what happened was a nice big hurricane hit off the coast of Taiwan and took out six of the seven Pacific trunks, uh, you know, between North America and Asia. And so, you know, there's one trunk left and there's some runs through Europe. So the, you know, the telecommunications companies have to prioritize traffic. Well, guess what? VFX companies are about as far at the bottom of the total pool of traffic for organization as you can possibly imagine. I mean, you know, banks and things are, are way over the top. So even though we had contracted redundancy, a natural disaster was enough that it took out not just our redundant expectations, but almost three times our redundancy. So the real world example is you could get shot in it. Well, it could also could have happened at one of your studios. Oh, yeah. sure. They yeah. don't have a place to work. Whereas if you have your kids on I mean, how would you do this? Well, <laughs> there's always a black swan somewhere. But that, this talk is, uh, is, is really interesting. I mean, I like the idea that a, that a next gen um, render system could do the kind of optimizations that, uh, that um, I was hearing about earlier where. Um, different parts of the the uh, the rigs for the animations were being paralyzed as much as possible. So I like the idea that a next gen render farm could see where all the data is coming from, see which jobs are going to make the most optimal use of that, and paralyze that, squish it up, try and get it happening as fast as possible. So, um, you know, let's let's assume you have an asset pipeline, and you have a premise graph, and you know how everything stacks together. And you have historical data, and you can you have full data in that that you, you can sort of rely on average at least to some degree that makes sense. You do run that some constraint simulation to add. This is my current state of the queue, and I have go and figure out the best outcome. And the best outcome would be time, or throughput, or whatever you want to look for, right? And I used to work for another company that you know, went to bankruptcy and got bought out of here, but they were really good. Yeah. No, but then we had six locations around the world and we actually got to that point where we had a pretty uniform UI that tapped into all the resources around the world. We could at least look at this, but we couldn't integrate it across. But we had at least enough data historically to say, hey, would it be cool to get this pick a scheduling algorithm, stick it in some sort of like simulation engine and run the scenario. There's a lot of scenarios. I mean, a lot of industries do pre intensive simulations. I mean, even ones that you know aren't about you know processing or saving lives or anything. I mean, you know, there's a um, I had a chance to visit Major League Baseball a while ago and uh, talk to some people, and they you know, they run continual stochastic simulations, like large scale Monte Carlo simulations, constantly all day to predict the likelihood of a team being the wild card. You know? And they're, they're, because, well, sports makes a lot of money. So there, there's certainly a whole bunch of, I think, things that could happen. That it's just, are people wanting to engage? Do people want to, you know, realistically sort of optimize that level? And what do you want, like, they do, right? You know, I'm a huge fan of the measure everything philosophy. You know, if you start thinking about your whole sort of pipeline in that sense, is, you know, you probably want to start measuring things like, how many publishes do I do of it? You know, how big is each of those publish? What's the 90th percentile of those? Because that's going to feed into something along those lines of, 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 you know, well, should that be processed locally? Should that be you know, combined with this other thing that you're not supposed to be to? In a way, the, the main thing is, I'm sure the cap providers themselves should be interested in knowing that they are right, because it's the bandwidth. Your knowledge about how, how, how far we're going to work, you know, 
Um, the hidden costs of um, using the cloud as opposed to the shame of advantages of using it. Um, does anybody have any experiences that are important? Do you mean for after? I think one of the things that we hear about going into the cloud um, is that production often, you know, if, if the computer's available, they'll just keep taking more and more, and that's, you know, that's something that we want to figure out a way of managing once we do go into the cloud. So I think Inevitably, everyone's trying to solve this, and we will do, but that's the thing that we, we have to try and manage and find a way to, to put the price on that. Yeah, a render will always take an hour, and the goldfish will grow as big as the So somebody mentioned earlier um, something about gamifying the, the submission. We tried that to get the desktop users to uh, donate their machine or core out. So in our queue, they can, uh, especially <coughs> like the IT department, they can donate a number of cores during the day, we got about 20% return by turning it into a game with a web interface, um, battling departments against each other. Yeah. No, no. Just, just they got to go home right away. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> a number of us have had those reports like top 10 render hogs with high 10 memory hogs is all What the hell is wrong with you? But they were worse than try and be at the top of the list. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So if we can automate that tied to the HR systems, <laughs> I will say that's not quite yet. That may be true for them individually, but we just started doing a thing where we put the top 10 disk cards um, on display in the kitchen. And um, they get a lot of shit from their peers for that. So it's, it's actually quite They get a lot of shit from their peers and like, I can't render because you took up all the disks. But so I'm saying that the public shaming is working. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you were talking about analytics earlier. Um, we're getting some leverage out of using tools like Splunk and Elasticsearch to do, to you know, to create dashboards or look at, look, look, you know, find patterns and stuff. Uh, anyone else? Yeah. yeah well, I mean, we're Splunk is pretty expensive, but like it's, it's not a really great tool. We're looking at that. Uh, it was it was ugly. It didn't, wasn't necessarily customized. This idea of I've got a thousand things that I want to you know, get done. Uh, this is why. Yeah. I mean, I mean Splunk's really great for that. Well, it's really great for that. And there's, there's, you know, I think it's a. We should check out stuff. <laughs> Thanks, Jerry. <Jeremy. laughs> That's like I, I didn't pick. Um, but it's sort of a different problem. I think the, you know, things like Splunk and I think Elasticsearch falls in this category. I mean, you can use lots of other kind of databases. But one of the things I see is you do have to look at the problem as to potentially different types of data stores for how you can interact with it. You know, for sort of real time, I want a lot of read response, you know, sort of the, the typical sort of monitoring CPU sort of application. Is you want something that has really fast inserts, and you want something that can also screen reads from relatively quickly. In that <coughs> data mining, going through historical, you know, trend analysis thing, if you start looking at something that's got a you know great indexing scalable scheme like Elasticsearch or something like Splunk, but if you try and jam one one of those problems into the back end of the other, in my opinion, it doesn't work all that well. But the cool part about that is, is there there are a lot of open source projects, you know, not just commercial ones like Splunk, but but open source projects out there that are you know, really interested in both big data mining or analytics and time series databasing things. And it's a, it's a really active community right now. There's, there's a lot of great stuff to check out. You know, again, I'm not talking about my work, but the way I focus that is to use basically as much of a completely open source backend as possible and just try to you know, provide a way to have good ways of viewing that for visualization techniques and clean sort of studio central ways of accessing it. But I think you can start tying that into your pipeline. I mean, a lot of people's, this is the render bar stuff, but a lot of people's pipelines are becoming more and more event driven. There's been some, I think, a couple of really great talks already this year. People are using their round MQ and celery and message passing techniques. Those are perfect entry points to just, you know, light off a whole lot of other logging statistics and event driven stuff that you can data mine and use to further tune. There's, there's a huge potential for a bunch of these things that people are doing to start integrating back into you know, something like render management. Which yeah. was that point we were talking about earlier about scheduling, right? Like you're, you're, you're mentioning scheduling based off of like uh, deadlines and things like that. But all of that is dependent on proper data coming in. Is that shot really you that long? Did that take, when did the actual frame rate of that shot? So plugging all that other metadata, all that other, all that other uh, analytics in terms of 
what's actually been done, how many versions have been done, and integrated. So does that mean if I if I invented this great new thing and I, I installed it and I had no prior history, it wouldn't work? Like, would it need six months of rendering <laughs> to see it to, um, to get the place where it didn't get used to? Depends on how consistent your data is. Like, you know, I mean, it depends on the, the noise and the frequency of threads, right? Just curious, this I'm going to do house weather show accounts, like, which no one's going to put on the ground, I'm sure. But, um, you know, how many people are, are doing sort of this kind of throwing everything into, you know, a big old MySQL database and have been for the last five years and frankly never actually looked at it? <laughs> How many people do that and actually look at it? Oh, that's good. Okay. I inherited like a bunch of stuff in the previous <laughs> years, and I have yet to sort through it. I mean, metrics and analytics are something we're still trying to figure out. Yeah. We have too many sources. I'm sorry, too many sources, and we're trying to figure out kind of like a single abstract way to collect all the information. Yeah, that's, 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 that's not just our problem. That's yeah. a general problem. So, right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. Yes, so, if, you if you guys haven't checked out Tableau, you yeah, can check out the previous solution. Exactly that awesome. Yeah. Well. Yeah. We've, been, we've been looking like SASD and things like that. Yeah, SASD is great. We're going to make SASD feeding graph later in the back end. Yeah. 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 Is it, I wonder if the panel could talk a little bit about GP, GPU computing and is there a place for a hybrid model of a render farm using both CPU and GPU? Yeah. GPU is obviously really great at floating points and GI calculation, which could really speed up the beauty pass renders. Um, do you see a future in that, potentially? Or do you just see them as discreetly separate? It depends on the application tools. you're using. So it's really, it really tied down to DCC package, whether you support or GPU. Sure. What version is a CPU version? And because it evolves so fast, that you know you you gotta make sure that whatever they have on the other side sort of match that. And if we're still having problem with drivers nowadays, like you know, so this is sort of like the, the type of challenge is can I make the client run on this particular graphics card nicely? Or is the same problem on the cloud? It's it's to be able to get this sort of driver app to match perfectly. And I think that would be sort of my concern if I to go. I think Phil has a great story about that. Well, I don't know if I've uh, wasn't that a story, but just what I was going to say is, you know, we're talking about whether what's the future. Uh, that's not the future. I mean, that's actually now. I mean, I know of, and have for a while, both large studios and their internal systems and commercial products that can schedule a job to run on the GPU just as well as you can run the CPU. And you know, people do do that. It, you know, if your pipeline takes advantage of it because it has the code that actually has GPU accelerated, that's great. But um, you know, unless somebody wants to jump in quickly, I don't really see any huge impediments to any number of products or systems right now being able to schedule a GPU in the same way you might have it. No, I think one of the problems is that GPUs have tended to be a fairly dollar intensive optimization. Right. you have them, or yeah. can I get a job on them? Yeah. Or do I have something meaningful to actually run on them? Yeah. Unless you're talking about you know some GPU scheduling where you know you've got you know they go you know 8K40s or something in it, and you're actually trying to run multiple jobs across the you know, a, a joint series of cars you're trying to partition out down on the real level. Well, that's a whole different problem. But, you know, I don't think there's a commercial render farm schedule that comes in. Well, no, I mean, that's that's it's the same thing as a multi cloud right? Like, they don't want the render farm to actually be managed in But there's two types of GPUs. It's like, it's either you utilize the, the actual GPU on the thing, sort of this virtual unit, or you basically get the GPU jobs on the sort of some ending of the CA or something like that, which is tuned for a particular type of job and will ensure that it works. So I think it's it serves like oh let's just use the GPU. I think it's uh, you know it's it's more leveraging like the desktop. It gets back to Darren's earlier point that render farms are are very specific anymore. They're very diverse group of applications and not that many take advantage of what I call the dollar intensive GPU acceleration. So it tends to be more of a trend towards low, low cost commodity processing. Yeah, but I do think that in terms of the render queue of the future, it has to be a cost, not just, not just between CPU and GPU, but also uh, you can do local scheduling on the, on the like gamification of the extra stuff that you have apart from just the extra stuff that you have locally, you can be rendering some of that, local, some of your job locally on the thing event. Your local CPU is usually a decent reserve for you. Then that agnostic, being agnostic about whether it's a, whether it's your essentially 
private cloud, like your local disk or your local compute, or a private cloud compute for a private cloud for Yeah, I think we have one more question. I think that's probably all we have time for. I'm just curious for the future. I mean, is there any desire to reclaim unused uh, cycles throughout the rest of the organization? You know, there's all these projects about hey, we rendered this big thing using all these phone cycles. I mean, is there is there any uh, look in the future to using that as a definition of a render I farm? Think we're lucky we can just use the desktops when people aren't there. I suppose, I mean, that would definitely be the future here. We can suck everything up and you know, destroy everything with proximity batteries to proximity yeah. network so we don't actually have to plug them in. But uh, yeah, it, would, yeah it, would be, it would be interesting to where you could consume cycles. I think the thing is the extra cycles in most typical visual effects animation organizations, not counting rendering on people's desktops or IDs and stuff at night, uh, but whether they're uh, using it. The rest of the compute power within the facilities tends to not have the compute capabilities. Usually, RAM restriction. It's usually a memory restriction or an I/O restriction problem. So that even though you have CPU cycles, if you add up all those iPhones and iPads and finance people's machines, in fact, you just don't have enough physical memory to load any data on the things to use the compute cycles. Well, I think that's the overhead of, of, get, of getting it loaded in, right. and then of getting any meaningful quantum of data back out of it. You know, if you have to sit back for a 12-hour get you ready to run on your phone, which is probably not going to happen this year. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you didn't see it? <laughs> 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 All right. I, I think I, I've been running out of time. I just want to thank my fellow panelists, Darren, David, Troy, Bill. Um, thank you for coming. This